Um, welcome to this time of worship, whether you're here in person or whether you're with us via WEF on the web. Uh, it's good to have an opportunity to worship God. Um, notices, the only notice I think to add to what's been on this screen is to say that Cafe starts at 10 in the morning, it being uh, uh, another bank holiday. Um, so uh, don't come before 10. Uh, uh, but apart from that, I think everything was on the uh, is on the screen. Heather has chosen uh, the songs tonight, all with the theme of King of Kings, um, appropriately after uh, the King of the United Kingdom was crowned yesterday, we are reminded that uh, the Creator God is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so that will be our theme through the service until uh, Robin comes to, uh, to speak to us towards the end. Um, and to set the scene, uh, Phyllis is going to come and read Psalm 24. Psalm 24 is uh, uh, described as a processional liturgy. And um, Derek Tidball, in his um, devotional commentary on the Psalms, says it reminds him of when, as a primary school child, he was standing in a village waving his... Uh, Union flag as the recently crowned Queen Elizabeth went past. And he writes uh, in his commentary, how much more care should we exercise in greeting the King of glory, the Lord Almighty, who is no mere constitutional monarch. So uh, we can think of that as we hear Psalm 24. Thank you, Phyllis. Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. He will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God his Saviour. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O you gates, be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. Thank you, Philip. Let's just uh, pray. Father God, we thank you that we can come to worship you. As we've heard in that psalm, who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Father, we thank you because of your grace extended to us in Christ. We can be counted as clean. We can have our worship acceptable to you because you wipe out our sin. And so, Father, we thank you and we celebrate you as the King of Kings. And we do it in the name of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And our first hymn on the theme is Jesus is King. Thank you, Heather.
Robin, could, could you put up again the second verse of that, uh, that hymn? We'll have uh, a time now of adoration prayer, uh, giving worship to God for who he is and what he's done for us. We've sung, we have a hope that is steadfast and certain. Gone through the curtain and touching the throne, we have a priest who is there interceding, pouring his grace on our lives day by day. There's so much theology in the whole hymn, but particularly in that verse. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that as your son was crucified on the cross, a curtain temple was torn in two, signifying our access into the Holy of Holies. We thank you that Jesus not only died to save us from the consequences of our sin, but he is there interceding with you at your throne, pouring his grace on our lives day by day. In a moment of silence, we'll just reflect, Father, on that fact, that truth. Thank you, Father, for our experience of your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. If anyone else would like to offer prayers of adoration at this point. Amen. 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 And in the third verse we sang, laying our lives with gladness before him, filled with his spirit, we worship the king. We thank you, Father, that not only did you offer us salvation and eternal life, through Christ's death and resurrection. But you give us your Holy Spirit, the guide to direct our lives. We give you the thanks for the completeness of your plan of salvation, the totality of the grace which you offer to us. And as we sang, laying our lives with gladness before you, Father, we offer to you all that we can, our lives, in service, not just of other people, but in our service of you. We do it for the, in the name of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.
We're going to have a second, a New Testament reading. This sounds a bit like an Anglican service, doesn't it? You have Old Testament and New Testament. Danny is going to read to us from Ephesians 1. Thank you, Danny. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 to 23. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Thanksgiving and prayer. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Amen. Thank you, Danny. And uh, in that reading, Paul is explaining that he is writing to people who have committed their lives to Christ, who have heard the gospel, the word of truth, and have responded to it. And this is one of the two great prayers of Paul uh, for the Ephesians, and uh, so much a, a model uh, of prayer. What does he pray for them? That they will have the spirit of wisdom and revelation to know God better, that they will know the hope to which we have been called, and we will experience the power which uh, Paul writes so graphically is the same power that was used to raise Christ uh, from death. We're going to spend a time now of um, prayer, prayers of supplication, uh, but just a few words uh, almost inevitably about yesterday's uh, coronation. Um, I don't think we can say that this is any more a Christian country, but how do you define a Christian country? Uh, one definition, which I would like to, to think would be true, is that the majority of people uh, are Christians who, who have trusted Christ for salvation, but unfortunately that's not true. But we are still a country that when it comes to an important event like crowning our monarch, it is set in the context of a Christian service. It could well by now have changed from that, uh, not thinking of being a republic, but thinking still of having a monarchy. People could have cast aside the Christian background to that, but they haven't. And we should really thank God that 
yesterday's service was primarily a service of Christian worship and the king and queen took communion as part of that service. It was a Christian event. Two readings, not an old a New Testament, but a, a, an epistle and a gospel. And the whole event was set in the context uh, of Christian worship. And we should thank God uh, for that. I remember many years ago when I was a reader in the Church of England and I took a service at uh, uh, one church, I was reprimanded afterwards by the um, church warden for not praying for Elizabeth, our queen, and the royal family uh, in the, uh, the older version of the uh, Anglican service. There was a prayer which was usually used, but not always. And certainly uh, at St. Michael's, we didn't use it uh, every week, but at this particular parish church, the warden was very annoyed that I hadn't used it. Um, but it is right that we pray for our monarch. We were reminded in the uh, church email on Friday that not only do we respect and honor those set over us, but we pray for them. And so uh, I'm going to say a prayer uh, for uh, the king. Um, it's a prayer that uh, is online um, and, and put up by uh, the Christian organization CARE. Um, and then I will read the prayer which is the main prayer for the um, House of Commons. Uh, the, uh, every sitting in the House of Commons begins with a Christian prayer. Of course, not everyone uh, is there, but it is still there. It's still in its important part uh, of our, um, our, our, not our constitution as such, um, but there is that uh, ability to pray before uh, sittings of Parliament. So first of all, a prayer for the King. Let's pray. Lord God, you provide for your people by your power and rule over them in love. Grant to your servant, our King, Charles III, the spirit of wisdom and discernment, that being devoted to you with his whole heart, he may so wisely govern that in his time we may live in safety and in peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And when, I, or when we pray the, the prayer for the uh, House of Commons, I'd like to include within it um, local government. Um, on Thursday, we elected uh, new um, members of uh, Cheshire West and Chester Council. Um, some new, some are going back to what they've done for several years. Uh, but I do feel for those foot soldiers, first of all, some uh, people who stood as candidates and those who are supporting them, who've spent hours in the last fortnight going around, distributing leaflets, knocking on your door, uh, trying to encourage you to worship. And then in, in um, what's called Huntingdon and Christleton, but includes Waverton, a few other villages, um, it was the, the same people who were returned as previously, and we haven't heard from them <laughs> in the process. Uh, so, as I say, uh, I do feel sorry for those who put so much effort uh, into the process um, to no avail. But that, that's an aside. Let's pray for those in government, both nationally and locally. Lord God, Lord, the God of righteousness and truth, Grant to our King and his government, to members of Parliament and all in positions of responsibility, the guidance of your spirit. May they never lead the nation wrongly through love of power, desire to please, or unworthy ideals. But laying aside all private interests and prejudices, keep in mind their responsibility to seek to improve the condition of all mankind. So may your kingdom come and your name be hallowed. Amen. Let us now pray one or two other concerns that we have. Uh, let's pray uh, for our fellowship here uh, and the work of this church. Father, we thank you for setting us in this place. We thank you for the fellowship that we have one with another and the opportunity to grow as Christians through our, our, our membership here. 
We pray for the outreach of this church. We pray for the cafe tomorrow. We thank you that so many people come along to that. We do pray that as they come along to that, they may recognize that they're coming to, yes, a house of God, to a people of God, and might be willing, Father, to inquire about faith in you. We thank you for our children and young people's ministry, for the meetings this week. We think of those teenagers who will be facing exams this month. And we pray, Father, that those young people who know Christ as their Savior will commit their preparation to, to him. They will be blessed by you because of the way in which they go about that process. And for those children and young people, Father, who don't know Christ as yet, we do pray that they will take a step along that road to coming to faith in you. And we pray also for their siblings and their parents and families, Father. We thank you for those who are here this morning at uh, Shake Up. And we just pray, Father, that the outreach of this church might be blessed by you and might be used by you to extend your, your, your witness into the village because we ask it for Christ's sake. Amen. And let's conclude these prayers with the Lord's Prayer and using the uh, generally used contemporary version. I, I do feel that we ought to use contemporary language rather than the language of um, several centuries ago. It's just a, a personal feeling, but I hope you'll join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We will sing two more, sing, two more songs uh, about uh, the King of Kings, King of King Majesty, and then we'll go straight into the King is amongst us. And uh, we will be singing the chorus is, Your Majesty, I can but bow. I lay my all before you now in royal robes I don't deserve. I live to serve your majesty. We're giving our allegiance to the King of Kings. Thank you, Heather.
Let's sit to pray as Robin prepares to come to speak to us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your word, your written word. We thank you that it is so easily available to us. We thank you for the gift of preaching, which Robin has. We pray that you will bless him as he brings your word to us this evening, and also that we will be blessed as he opens up your word to us, because we ask it for Christ's sake. Amen. Thanks, Jeff. We're beginning a new series for evenings. Well, actually, we're beginning a new series for mornings as well. And we're looking at uh, Four Great Lovers. It's another one of these Life Builder study series, which I think are really helpful because they follow a theme. They give you a good selection of Old and New Testament passages. And if you were doing it as a study, then there's some questions and reflection guides in it. So we're looking at four great loves, and we're spending two evenings looking at each of the great loves. So two weeks looking at loving God, two weeks looking at loving God's word, two weeks looking at loving God's people, and two weeks looking at loving God's purposes. So that should take us well into the middle of summer. In case you're wondering, in mornings, uh, I've been promising a few people for a while that we'd look at Revelation. So we're having a dive into that starting next Sunday morning. So fasten your seatbelts. This evening then, loving God through worship. And the passage is Psalm 116. So many of the Psalms are expressions of of worship and uh, I wondered at first why the, the, the author of, of the, the book had chosen Psalm 116 and then I read it and then I reread it and then I read some commentaries about it and then I read it again and, uh, and got this grasp of what the psalmist, we're not sure, it, it, some people have attributed it to David but that's not definite, what the psalmist was trying to express through it. Let's read it together and then let's explore it together. Psalm 116. I love the Lord for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy because he turned his ear to me. I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the unwary. When I was brought low, He saved me. Return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I trusted in the Lord when I said, I am greatly afflicted. In my alarm, I said, Everyone is a liar. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Truly I am a servant, Lord, I serve you just as my mother did. You have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you. I will call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord. In your midst, Jerusalem. 
Praise the Lord. There's a verse in the middle of that which we'll come to, which might sound strange. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the, what was it? It's the death of his servants. We'll, we'll get to that and hopefully you'll see that it's not quite how it sounds. So where does it come from? Where does Psalm 106 come from? Well, uh, the origin is, is relatively certain. It's it, it part of liturgical role in Jewish tradition. It came to be, and it's, it's now read as part of a, a larger group of psalms, Psalm 113 to 118, known as the Egyptian Hallel. And that's where we get our word praise from, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. So it's an expression of praise, and that's how it starts off. And strangely, unlike a lot of other psalms where um, the, the, it, the psalmist will make a statement about God, God is great, God is steadfast, God is... This starts off with this simple expression. I love the Lord. And it's quite a unique way of, of doing it. But, but the, the word that the psalmist chooses for love, Ahab, it, it, it's more, it, 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 it invokes more than just an emotion, more than, than if you were saying to your, 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 your spouse, oh, I love you, or your, your offspring, your child, I love you. It's more than just that. It's more than an, an emotion. It's this commitment to loyalty. It's a covenant statement. So when the psalmist is saying, I love the Lord, it's more than, than saying, oh, I love you, Lord, you're so wonderful, you're so, uh, you give me this nice feeling inside. And he's making a covenant statement that every fiber of his being is devoted to the Lord. So it's a really deep statement that he's making right at the beginning of this psalm. I love you, Lord. I devote my life to you. It's this, this idea of, uh, of passionate adoration. And, and it's something that we lose in the English language because we only have one word for love. Hebrew had many words for love. Greek had... Uh, about six and four of them are used in the, in the New Testament. We just got one. And, and it's, we lose it because we can say, oh, I, I, I love a nice cup of coffee. Or I love my wife. Or I love my children. Or I love God. And each one of them have got a different meaning and a different type of love. And it's very easy to lose this sense of... Um, the psalmist is all in here. He's holding nothing back from God. We could probably, I could probably quite adequately do a 20-minute sermon just on this one line of, I, I love the Lord. Why did he love the Lord? Well, I love the Lord for he heard my voice. The psalmist is painting this picture of not a, a pagan God, not a remote God, not this made-up deity, but a God who takes the time and actually bothers to listen to him. And again, it's easy to read that and to gloss. I love the Lord for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. But let's just pause for a moment. Because the psalmist is saying the creator of everything takes time out to listen to one man's cry. Just let that settle with you for a, for a moment. The creator, the sustainer of the universe takes time out to listen when we cry to him. Don't know about you, but but not so much now because our kids have grown up. But when they were, were, were younger, you're busy doing something, and it's dad, dad. Can, in a minute, I'm busy. Dad, can you? No, no, I'm, I'm really busy. Just ask me later. Dad, dad, and ask me later. There's no sense of that with God. 
God is never too busy to hear the cry of our voice. There's never an inappropriate time. There's never too early in the morning or too late at night. Or There's no time that God doesn't hear us when we cry out to him. And when you think of who God is and who we are, the idea of that is, is, is quite overwhelming. There's a sequence that the psalmist gives us, and we're going to build it upon the screen. So he loves the Lord, and, and as a result of knowing that the Lord hears his cry for mercy, what does he do? I'll call on the Lord. This idea of calling on the Lord is it, it's not just a, a cry for help. It's not just a last resort. It's not just, uh, well, I'll leave God up there until I'm in trouble, and then I'll call on the Lord. It's this idea of constantly having a conversation with God, of constantly calling on the name of the Lord, of invoking the name of the Lord in everything that the psalmist does. I love the Lord because he hears my voice. He's heard my cry for mercy. Because he turns his ear to me, I will call on him whenever I've got a bit of spare time. Or whenever I feel in trouble. He says, I will call on him as long as I live. It's all tied up in this covenant state, statement that he's making. I love the Lord because he hears me. He's a God who, who is alive and who is real and who takes his time out to listen to, to, to me when I call upon him. And so because of that, I'll call on him for my whole life, as long as I live. Not just when I feel like, not just when I've got a spare moment, not just when there's this horrible thing that's invading the churches that have been around for ages called um, uh, moralistic therapeutic deism, if you say it. It makes people think you're much more clever than you really are. Uh, but it means that, that, that I'll park God on a shelf and I'll leave him there until I need him. Because I know that he'll answer my prayer when I need him, but when life's going okay or when it seems to be going okay, I don't need God. So I'll put him, put him on the shelf. Or I'll leave him there a little bit like a fire alarm in case of emergency break glass. And then when I need him, I'll pray to him, knowing that he'll answer me. This is not what the psalmist is saying. This is this continual covenant conversation with God. But then it all starts to get a little bit dark, because he says, the cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and, and sorrow. So he, he's coming near to, to death. We don't know why. We don't know what the problem was. Just excuse me while I lubricate my vocal cords. We don't know whether it was illness. We don't know whether he's been under some sort of physical persecution. He was certainly under some sort of um, verbal persecution, as we, we'll see in a moment. But whatever it was, it was pretty drastic. And he's using this metaphor of, because I don't think he literally had a cord of death entangling him, a rope tangling him up, but that's the picture that he conjures up. This, the cords of, of death, that whatever it was that was putting him in this situation had him held captive. The anguish of the grave came over me. He was, he was almost at the point of, of losing it all, and he was overcome by distress and sorrow. I was surprised. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Save me. Save me. What's the response? See, interestingly, he... he he, he 
changes the way that he's speaking in verse 5 because he's talking in the first person about, he's talking about himself. I love the Lord. Uh, I will call on him. The cause of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave. I called on the name of the Lord. And then he flips it to, the, to what we often see in the Psalms, which is this statement of truth, this expression of, of truth about, about God. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the unwary. When I was brought low, he now and then he goes back to talking about himself, his own situation. So we've got this little flick of, uh, I call upon the Lord, I'm in this terrible situation. I I called upon the Lord. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. He's stating a truth. Right in the middle of all this narrative uh, about his his woe and his near-death experience. And then he changes tack again, and he speaks to his soul. And he says, return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death. There's so many, if you read this, you have to read it and reread it and read it slowly to, to, to grasp the full depth of it. Because he changes from talking about himself to talking about God to talking to his soul. And, and now he's changed again because he's, he's now praying directly to God himself for you, Lord. He's not talking about God here. He's talking to God. You, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. And now he's back to talking about himself again. I trusted in the Lord when I said I am greatly afflicted. In my alarm, I said everyone is a liar. Well, what's that about? We don't know exactly. Maybe he's been under some sort of um, persecution. That the, the people around him have been slandering him. Maybe it, it, it's to do with his reliance on God. That, that people are saying to him, what are you crying out for, to God for? He won't help you because he doesn't exist. It's all made up. It's all a story. He might as well cry out to one of these golden calves that we've made or one of these other pagan images that we've made because how many times have you heard that or or read that? There's no use in praying because God doesn't hear you because guess what? He doesn't exist. (laughs) Fool you. His response, everyone is a liar. Nobody is speaking the truth. Then he, 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 he turns tack again a little bit. He's, he's zigzagging all over the, the, uh, the metaphorical lake in his metaphorical boat here. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? So he's, he's recognized that God listens to him when he cries out. To him, he recognized that before his time of distress, then he has this time of deep distress and this near death experience. Then he realizes that those who scoff at him and maybe scoff at God, we don't exactly know, are, 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 are people who have, of lies, they're not telling the truth. But what he does know and what he is sure of is that God is gracious righteous and full of compassion and has helped him because now he's not near death now he hasn't got the the cords of death entangled around him and he's not uh, got the shadow of the the grave hanging over him and and so he says well what what am i going to do in response to this and it's 
Although the, the language that, that we read infers this, how shall I repay the Lord's goodness? It's more, how will I respond to the Lord's goodness? Because he can't repay it. He can't equal what God has done for him. What's his response? He says, I will lift up the cup of salvation. Interesting, because, um, let's just find it in my notes. This psalm is read at Passover time. And so the cup of salvation that he's lifting up is this reference to the Passover cup that's lifted up. And hopefully it doesn't take a quantum leap to see that this is a prophetic reference to the cup of salvation that Jesus demonstrated to his disciples at the Last Supper, but also the the metaphorical cup of salvation of Jesus shed blood for us. We do it every time we, we share communion. And we talk about the cup that we, that we drink together as, as being this blood of the new covenant, the blood that guarantees our salvation. Well, here it is, thousands of years before. He says, I will lift up the cup of salvation. And here it is again, this phrase, and call on the name of the Lord. So he's not content just to call on the name of the Lord when he's in trouble. Just to call on the name of the Lord to see if he'll answer him. He's now calling on the name of the Lord out of thanksgiving that the Lord has saved him from physical death. But we can apply that to us. We could so easily say, I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. Why? Because Christ has saved us from spiritual death. From his cup of salvation. See, God needs nothing. He he owns it all. There's nothing. It's like the joke, what do you give the person who has everything? Well, we can't give out anything to God. Or can we? We can give ourselves. We can, we can, with the, the psalmist, see, here's the idea when he says, I will call on the name of the Lord all the days of my life. He's giving his whole life over to the service of God in response to what God has done for him. And here's this picture of the New Testament of Jesus. I will lift up the cup of salvation, call on the name of the Lord, fulfill my vows to the Lord. And it's this idea of us giving our lives over to Jesus for what he did for us on the cross and and lifting up, recognizing this cup of salvation which only comes from him. And then there's this strange verse in the middle of it. Um, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Well, That sounds a little bit weird, doesn't it? Because why would God... I'm just trying to find it in my notes here. Why would God say that the death of a faithful servant was was precious? That just doesn't seem to make sense. Well, you might have picked up that it's all in the language. It's all in the translation. The word translated precious... Um, the Hebrew pronunciation is not particularly good. Yacha means something like costly. Now, all of a sudden, the meaning term changes from uh, 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 looking upon something. It's a bit like if you were to see a a little child doing something for the first time, and you go, oh, isn't that a precious moment? 
The first time they walk, the first time they, they, the, the first words, or the first, it, it, the first time they do something. And you say, oh gosh, isn't that a precious moment? And that's how we, we, can, we can tend to read that and think, hang on. How, how can God view that as precious? How can God view the, the death of one of his faithful servants and precious? That's, that's not what the psalmist is saying. It's rather like a precious stone, a precious jewel. So precious in the sight of the Lord is the, the, is the death of his faithful servants. It's, it's something that's costly. Something that costs God. And maybe, well, no, maybe that's, the psalmist relates that to, to God pulling him back from the brink of this premature death, whatever the cause of it was. But of course, there's a New Testament parallel. Costly in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Here, let's, let's not talk about physical death, but spiritual death. So, so costly in the sight of the Lord is the exclusion from him of his creation. Those who he created in his own image. And we get back to this idea of the cup of salvation and the cost of of sending Jesus to the cross so that we wouldn't die. We wouldn't have this spiritual death, this separation from him. And then we start to wrap it up and he says, Truly I am your servant, Lord. I'll serve you just as my mother did. You freed me from my chains. We could could go on about that. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord. Praise the Lord. So in response to everything that he's now recognized that God does and has done for him, he's dedicating himself to a life of worship. Loving God through worshiping him. And, and it, it, it got me to, to thinking as I, as I was reading uh, around this, This sacrificing of a thank offering, calling on the name of the Lord, fulfilling the vows in the presence of of all his people. This guy's making himself into a, he's turning his life into a life of worship. He's calling on the Lord, this act of worship, all the days of his life. It's John Piper who said, if the vital essence of that inner experience we called worship is being satisfied in God or a cherishing Christ as gain above all things. This accounts for why Romans 12, 1 to 2 portrays all of life as worship. I will call on the name of the Lord all of my days. There's a danger that, that we um, narrow down worship to what we do in here of a Sunday. And or narrow it down even even narrower to 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 having certain things in, in, in a worship service where if we look at this writer of this psalm and, and, and certainly at Romans twelve, the idea is that everything we do should be worship. Because everything we do should bring glory to God. To God, there's a. If you lived through the 80s in the Christian world, then remember who remembers the Fisher folk? Anyone remember the Fisher folk? There was a song, um, "Pull in the weeds, Lord." Remember that? Pull in the weeds, Lord, living for Your glory. It had to be sung on a played on a 12-string guitar, and and you could stick in your own line for the verse, and it could go on for half an hour quite easily. And, and it was cheesier than a ripe gorgonzola. But the sentiment behind it was spot on. Because it said no matter what you can do, you can do it 
to the glory of God. Whether it's pulling the weeds or washing the dishes or driving your car, you can do it to the glory of God, and that becomes worship. And, and what we do here is the barometer of our worship. Just like the, the dial on the wall and you, you tap it and it says fair or change or rain or, or sun, it's an indication of what's going on outside. Then when we gather together for corporate worship, that's an indication, a barometer of what's going on in here. And if I don't worship God Monday through Saturday, then there's no way I can come on a Sunday and worship him in spirit and in truth. This psalmist has got the right idea. I will call on the name of the Lord. This idea is not just about calling on God. God help me. The, the, the phrase here it, it invokes a sense of worship. I will worship the name of the Lord all the days of my life. Not just certain times. Not just certain places. Not just when I choose to. Not just when everything's right. Because here he was on the brink of death. And what was he doing? He was worshipping God, he was calling on the name of the Lord. We need to be careful that we, if we say worship is everything and everything is, is worship, we can become a little bit blasé about it and say, well, well you know, every, uh, uh, anything I do can be worship. Well, well, it can, but it's got to glorify God. It can't just be a random act. It can't just be a... But... but uh, I can go about my daily life in such a way that what I say and what I do and how I interact with people and how I drive my car and, and uh, glorifies God by the way in which I do it. And then that becomes worship. Psalmist makes it real clear, I think. He wants to call or he states his intention. I will call on the name of the Lord all the days of my life. Three times in that psalm he says, I will call on the name of the Lord. Three times he expresses his desire, his intention to worship God regardless. Regardless of what else is coming on. He's got all these people accusing him for whatever reason. He's going to worship God. He's got whatever it is going on in his life, whether it's an, an illness or a, an injury or, or, or whatever it is that's putting him on the brink of death. He worships God. He calls out in the name of the Lord. God responds, listens to him, delivers him from whatever it is, and what's his response? I'll call on the name of the Lord. I'll worship God. So here's the challenge. It's always a challenge. Isn't it? Can we, can I, I include myself in the we, can we get ourselves into this place where, with the psalmist, every day we call on the name of the Lord? Now, I'm not talking about the, a literal calling out on the name of the Lord, but we, 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 we use that that phrase as an indication that he's worshipping God. So can we worship God in everything that we do? And if what we're doing doesn't worship God, do we question whether we should be doing it at all? So that's the challenge. So tomorrow, when you're doing whatever it is you're doing, can you do it to the glory of God? Can you do it as if your body is a living sacrifice, holy, set apart, pleasing to God, which is your true and proper worship? See, there's, a, there's such a strong parallel between what Paul wrote to the Romans and what this psalmist writes. In view of God's great mercy, we just read it. God is gracious and merciful compassionate and in view of all that offer your bodies as a living sacrifice this oxymoron sacrifices weren't usually living this is your true and proper worship there's the challenge that when we get up in the morning when i get up in the morning whatever i do tomorrow is bank holiday so uh, i'm not sure what we're doing it depends on the weather i might go out for a walk with family or but whatever i'm doing 
Can I do it to the glory of God? And therefore, it become my true and proper worship so that I can call on the name of the Lord all the days of my life. song is the hymn crown him with many crowns the lamb upon his throne which reminds me of a phrase which justin welby used yesterday i don't know if you recall it but you know sometimes just a single phrase can be so important really to someone justin welby said for christ his throne was a cross of course it was on calvary he now is in the throne room with with his father god uh, and so we can sing, crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. But uh, I don't know if any of uh, others picked that up yesterday. Uh, for Jesus, his throne was a cross. And I pray that someone will reflect on that and begin the journey to faith. But let, for, uh, let us, who have made that journey, sing, crown him with many crowns. Thank you, Heather.
close by saying the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.